I'd like to welcome you to the place. This is the place for intellectual, spiritual, and scriptural honesty. <coughs> we are excited tonight because we have two gentlemen here tonight. One is a theist in transition, and then we have another gentleman who has come our way who was a theist, who actually went through the transition into agnosticism and wound up being an atheist. And so both of these fine gentlemen are here with us tonight. I'd like to make some comments before we get started and before my wife introduces them, that is, their names, etc. I would like to uh, state that if you do have a question concerning any of their comments during the show, please text them in to 850-572-7441. The number is 850-572-7441. I would be happy, uh, we will be happy to answer all of your questions if possible. And so tonight is all about trying to find um, a reason to move forward and why so many people are moving forward. And so I'm not going to delay the show. We've had almost eight minutes of technical difficulties. And so, honey, would you introduce these two gentlemen, please? Absolutely. Well, it's our pleasure to welcome all the way from Australia, uh, Enzo Colella. G'day. Hey there, Enzo. Nice to have you. Thank you. And we have Steve Essery. Um, How Steve, you doing tonight? Hey, doing fine. You were with uh, my husband the other night, and I didn't get a chance to be on the show, so um, it's a pleasure to be with you both. And we're so excited to learn of uh, your journeys. We all are on a journey. And y you two have um, probably similar um, steps in your journey that you are taking. And some of them could be so far apart. But I think we all intersect uh, when it comes to uh, the love of God. And regardless, uh, atheists, theists, uh, whatnot, our, our big thing here at The Place is love. And we believe, um, we believe in that, and we want to promote that, and we hope you guys do too. We know you do, regardless of your persuasions. And so it's just a pleasure to have you both. I think we're going to start with Steve uh, up to bat first. Steve, one of the things that I was impressed with the other night was uh, you were talking about how you were this youth pastor. And it was at that time that you were confronted by someone. Could you repeat some of that in brief, please? Sure, sure. Uh, a good friend of mine that I'd known for uh, many years, since I was a teenager actually, um, I had just left uh, my church and began going to her church. And she was the youth pastor there. So I approached her and said, uh, uh, hey, I'm, I'm glad you're here. I wanted to talk to you. I want to I help you out. She said, uh, I said, we got to save these kids from hell, uh, whatever it takes. So I'm here, you know. And uh, she said, well, there's something that I've been wanting to talk to you about. She said, for the past several years, I've been researching something. And I'm starting to think that maybe Jesus saved everyone. And... Uh, I, I couldn't believe what she was saying. I'd never heard anything like that in my life. I, uh, I stood up and started pacing the floor and, and started to explain to her just how wrong uh, she was and how dangerous her words were. Now, let me stop you. The, let me stop you real quick. Were you having yes. a panic attack when this took place? Uh, slightly. I would, I would, you know, it's been many years ago, almost six years ago. Uh, so I don't remember every detail of the day. I just remember that I was not happy. Uh, especially because we had went to the same churches, especially knowing that she was a youth pastor. And me with my background, I, I dreamed about hell all the time. You know, I, I hated uh, the thought of anybody going to hell. And just knowing that she did not believe people were going to hell, to me, put her job in jeopardy. It, it, made, it made it seem like she couldn't do her job. So I was really getting upset with her. Uh, and for the sake of those kids, you know, uh, mostly. 
And um, so, yeah, I, ex I uh, proceeded to explain to her how I was going to prove her wrong and how that that was going to be very easy to do. <laughs> I was quite cocky about it, uh, if you want to know the truth. And uh, Okay, let me stop uh, you right there. Why were okay. you so cocky? Well, because I knew. I knew she was wrong. You know, I, I was uh, what, what we call uh, solid <laughs> in our faith. I was unshakable. I was okay. thought to be unshakable. <laughs> Once again, let me interrupt you. What do you mean by faith? Your faith was unshakable because it seems like you had a lot of confidence. I know that hell exists, yeah. and by golly, people are going there if I don't get them saved. Is that kind of yeah. the attitude that you had? Yeah, exactly. I built my whole life around it. I volunteered countless hours of time uh, because of that belief um, if hell had not been an issue, you know, I don't know that I would have been so, I don't know that I would have been a youth pastor. Um, but, uh, you know, I just, w one thing that made me become a youth pastor was, uh, researching to see that 92% of Christians get saved before they're 20. So I thought, well, if I want to make the biggest impact in this world, uh, I need to, to shoot for those that are under 20 because once they turn 20, you're not going to catch them as easily. So that made me, you know, strategically say, if I'm going to save, you know, as many as I can from hell, teenagers are the way to go. Well, um, I, I've heard that. I've heard that if you can get the calf in, you can get the cow in. Yeah. And so uh, I don't think that practice is unusual. And so uh, in this, when, when this actually took place, uh, tell us about what, what changed your mind about hell? I mean, was it one of these two or three hour conversations that you had with someone or uh, did it take years? What did it take for I, you to change? It took, it took months. Um, and, you know, we didn't even talk about uh, hell, uh, Kim and I. She basically, uh, we never once brought it up. Um, we actually just started talking about whether or not Jesus saved the whole world. And we had that one short conversation, and that was it for a little while. I began studying on my own uh, until a, a couple days into it. I called my brother. He got involved, and uh, and we were back and forth, back and forth. You know, did you read this? Did you read that? And many times over the next few months, uh, I had to keep asking the question, you know, but what about the lake of fire? Why did God make this lake of fire if nobody's even going to go there? And I do remember this one specific time that uh, I hadn't even thought about it all day. I had been thinking about it for weeks up until that point. But then this one day, uh, all of a sudden, the thought just dropped in me and said, your old man was thrown into the lake of fire. And I immediately started, ran to my Bible and pulled it out and started reading and, and found out what I've come to the conclusion is that when Jesus died, all died, and that that lake of fire scene in Revelations 20 is symbolic of uh, the forgiveness of God whenever, like I said the other night, you know, we're all God's sheep, but sometimes we act like goats. And in order for God to forgive us, he took the symbol of that goat, our sinful nature, and tossed it into the fire. You know, I believe John, whenever John says, I saw all liars thrown into the fire, I believe that. But the book of Revelations is symbolic. John even tells us that in the first verse. So if John says this book is symbolic, then we have to look at what he says in Revelations 20 and say, well, then that's symbolic too. And uh, I think that's what it was. And, and it was just neat how it was coming to me. Um, just the more I saw it, the more little answers came in, the more I would find, you know, uh, evidence in the scriptures. And, and uh, it, it was, I would never trade a minute of it. It was an amazing journey. Do you have children? Yes, I have two. Do you think they need to get saved? No, not at all, not at all. And they're they're old enough that they did go through the you know sinners prayer in church. Uh, they're thirteen and sixteen now, and I've been in this for six years, so uh, they had a few years in church, but but they've had several years now uh, listening to dad on the phone <laughs> telling everybody he knows that there's no such thing as hell. And and uh, no, I believe that all mankind uh, was born again when Jesus rose from the dead. Steve, um, do you think that God had to forgive them of their quote-unquote sins? Well, you know, like we talked the other night um, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says that, you know, love keeps no record of wrongs. And 
my whole life, I thought that God had this tally book of all my sins, and every time I did anything, he wrote it down, and so I had to ask for forgiveness every single night, you know, <laughs> and, right. uh, and I did every single night and probably halfway through each day, but uh, it's been years now, and, you know, I don't feel any condemnation. I feel great, and, uh, and I've, you know, taught them, you know, obviously what, uh, what I've learned, and no, I'm not afraid uh, that God's holding their sin against them at all. In your opinion, what does it mean to be saved 2,000 years ago with Christ? What does that mean specifically? Hmm, that is a good question. I think that, uh, that uh, Paul uh, talked about this quite a bit. Um, you know, often uh, Romans, uh, I believe it's chapter 10, uh, is quoted to us where he says that we have to uh, confess our sins um, or believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. And I think if you'll read that chapter, uh, starting from the very beginning, you'll see that he's actually been talking about being saved from the law, which uh, was this impossible list of rules uh, that either God made for us or we made for ourselves. But um, what I think Jesus did was uh, reveal to us that God loves and accepts everyone equally, no matter what. And so we are saved from this list of rules that, again, either God made for us or we made for ourselves. Uh, and so... He is, in essence, set us free from that, set us free to, to have life, you know, and life more abundant, you know, just like he said. Um, we don't have to worry, is God angry at us? Is he, uh, you know, going to judge us one day? Uh, I think that now we can concentrate on uh, the bigger picture, uh, world peace and world hunger. <laughs> Not to sound like a Miss USA contestant, but... <laughs> <laughs> I understand. You know... Um... Do you think that all people, all of mankind, should be construed as God's created children? Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, that's something, uh, one of my favorite uh, passages is in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, uh, where he says that when the new covenant comes, it's not even going to be necessary to teach your neighbor or your brother to know God because all will know him. Uh, that he's going to put his spirit inside all of us. And I think that, you know, whether we believe in him, whether we love him or whether we hate him, uh, his spirit is inside of all of us. We're all connected because of that spirit of God. And yes, every single person is a child of God, uh, whether they believe it or not, uh, whether they love him or hate him, um, it doesn't matter. You know, I've been in the church and my wife and I both were raised in churches uh, and the church, actually, these pastors, uh, etc., would teach that we were lost, uh, that is, separated from God, and that Jesus came 2,000 years ago to bring us back to God because we were so far away, we were lost. And my question is, did God ever lose his children? Hmm. Um, if there was anything that was lost, uh, I would say it would be, you know, our relationship uh, with God uh, because of how we think. Um, there's a passage, and I, I could find it, but uh, uh, where Paul says something about um, that we were enemies of Christ or enemies of God in our own mind. You know, in our own mind, we were lost. We didn't understand that God loved us like a father loves his child, and uh you know, because of that, you know, we invented this list of rules and tried to follow that. So, so on the one hand, yeah, we were lost. We didn't uh, have a clue where we were. <laughs> did, did, did he lose us? No, we were the ones that were lost. He knew where we were the whole time, and he was always right there with us. So you're suggesting it was simply a mental issue with us. Is that correct? I believe so. I believe that uh, the Apostle Paul makes it clear uh, that you know the coming of Christ revealed uh, the life and immortality that he always planned from the beginning. So I don't think that we were ever actually destined uh, to go uh, to a lake of fire uh, in the literal sense. Um, I think we were always destined to be with him. Uh, obviously, he made us. You know, if you'll notice in the story of the, uh, the wheat and the tares, that the uh, enemy was the one that came in and sowed the tares. Uh, the, the enemy didn't sow the wheat. People are the wheat. Uh, Satan didn't uh, uh, create humans. 
so to say that some of the tares were actually humans and they're going to be burned away, uh, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, God planted all the wheat and all the wheat belongs to him. Do you think that Jesus died 2,000 years ago to wash away our sins so God could somehow forgive us so that we could be saved? Or do you think that Jesus was just murdered? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, if you just take the, uh, the King James Version of the Bible and read it, um, it sure does seem like he was predicting his own death and that, uh, and that he knew it was going to happen. Um, you know, I don't know what to think uh, at this point because all my life I have thought that he died uh, for the forgiveness of our sins. Now, whether that death was needed for the forgiveness or whether that death just revealed uh, the true nature of God, that he is always forgiving, um, I think it would have to be the latter, that it was more of a revelation uh, than anything. Uh, as far as just being murdered, it sure does seem to me that he knew it was coming. Um, I do believe that he was murdered, uh, but, uh, but he definitely you know, seemed to know that it was on the way. In, in most circles of Christianity, doesn't the doctrine of forgiveness imply that someone is holding a grudge or a record of wrongs against another? Yeah, and that's, a, you know, that's definitely a human nature thing. We can't understand somebody continually forgiving. You know, and like I said the other day, you know, if you if you want to know who God really is, uh, look at the day of the cross. It, they punched him and kicked him and spit in his face and did all kinds of crazy things to him, and he never stopped forgiving. He never even once said, "Oh, that hurt. I'm really mad." Oh, wait, no, I, I'm going to choose to forgive you. <laughs> he continually forgave, uh, constantly the whole time, and we can't understand that because. That's not how it happens for us. Uh, if somebody does something wrong to me, I, I get upset about it. Um, you know, I've went for a long time, long periods of time without forgiving someone before. Uh, I'm a human. I can't. I don't know how to continually forgive uh, in every single moment. You know, like I believe that God does. Um, well, let me ask you this: um, You are a father. Have you ever had to forgive one of your children? Oh, that's a good question. I've uh, I've gotten you know upset with them before for not doing something that I told them to do, um, but I don't think I ever held a grudge uh, right. against them. That's true. I, I mean, and I'm saying that's true because I know the heart of a father and the heart of a mother. You you don't for, have to forgive your children. I mean, they can hurt you. They can um, you know if they disrespect you or disappoint you or whatever, there's just nothing in a good parent that requires, you know, of them to forgive their children. And so, yeah. I, you know, I, I believe that about God. I believe that he's such a, a, a better parent than I am, a, a father figure or mother figure, that he doesn't hold these things against me when I disappoint him and, and when I disrespect him. You know, it's just something that he never has to go through with me. Yeah. Well, you know, my kids aren't perfect. Uh, they, they're they just like any other uh, typical teenagers. They, they don't take out the trash when they're <laughs> supposed to. They don't do the dishes when they're <laughs> supposed to. Uh, their room is a, a mess uh, on many occasions. And, uh, you know, but sometimes whenever we get on to them, we even have to turn our back so they can't see and chuckle a little bit because it's just fun watching them grow up. You know, watching them learn things, watching them become an adult. Uh, yeah, they do things, that, you know, that'll get on your nerves uh, from time to time, and, and you have to get on to them. But at the same time, you know, I wouldn't trade that for the world, you know, it, watching them grow. I right. agree with you. Is it possible that Jesus went to the cross for this purpose? Personally, I, I don't think that Jesus needed to be crucified. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, if the rulers of this age had have known the wisdom of God, they would have never crucified him. Which indicates that if we would have utilized God's wisdom, we would have never put him on the cross. Now, there are passages that do suggest that he laid down his life willingly. And so the question is, what does that mean? When you look at Matthew chapter 5, 
He said to the Jews, he said, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. And then he goes on, he says, you've heard it stated, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I'm going to tell you something quite different than the law tells you. I'm going to tell you to love your neighbor and your enemies. And so the question is, when he was going to the cross, was he trying to prove to us when we beat him beyond recognition? Was he trying to prove to us that love never strikes back? Do you see what I'm saying? Mm. In other words, here's yeah. here's love being uh, really manifested. You know, I have taught for three and a half years about what love is. Now I'm going to shut my mouth for a while, and I'm going to teach you what love is by my actions. And so yeah. did he lay down his life willingly to become a sacrifice to atone for sins, or did he lay his life down to demonstrate how we should love one another. Yeah. Well, I would have to say um, both. Uh, number one, because we, uh, the way that our understanding was, uh, we thought at least that God needed a sacrifice in order to forgive us. Uh, so he provided that, you know, he, he satisfied our own need uh, in that. Um, at the same time, yeah, of course. It, obviously, he proved uh, what love really is. I, since since I came to the conclusion that God loves and, and forgives and accepts all of us, I've always looked back to that day of the cross and used it as an example. If you want to know who God is, there, there it is right there. And there's no way that that guy walking the hill to the cross, there's no way that he's coming back just to burn this place to the ground and torture and kill all the sinners. And, you know, that's totally out of character with that guy. If you want to know who God is, just uh, just watch the passion of the Christ. Watch him walk up the hill and, uh, and watch how he acts towards people. If you want to know what God would do, if you punched him in the face, just remember they did punch him in the face, and look what he did. He just returned love the whole time. That's the same God that we serve. That's good. You know, he, he also showed us an example at the cross of what religion is capable of doing to God himself. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, religion, religious people, the religious system and, and their principles, um, dogma, doctrine, whatever you want to use, uh, the term you want to use, it, it was part of that. And so when he showed us this example, not only of this most magnificent example of love, of never striking back, but he went on to say, you know, look and see what religion is capable of. Do you agree well, with that? That's a good point. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. I've never really thought of it that way, but, you know, I have to, uh, I have to say that there's been plenty of times where I felt like um, people at the other end of the conversation wanted to crucify me. So, so I, think that, uh, I think that that's a good point, uh, uh, easily proven uh, mm -hmm. in that whole scene. In order to satisfy the Mosaic Law, as some claim that, that Jesus did, he died at the wrong place. In other words, the cross was actually the place that would be symbolically the place where you would be considered cursed of God because anyone who hangs on a tree is cursed of God according to their particular philosophy slash theology. And so it's, it's interesting that Jesus didn't follow after the order of Aaron, but he actually followed after the order of Melchizedek. And since he did follow after the order of Melchizedek, it was by law. He could not. He could not be a part of the Mosaic law. He had to have a different kind of law that followed him, if the book of Hebrews is accurate. And so the question would be, did he fulfill the Mosaic, or did he fulfill the law that he was talking about? The law that he talked about was just love. Yeah, and that's something that I, I'm afraid I haven't, uh, haven't studied up on. Um, yeah, I've always looked at it as the law of Moses uh, that he fulfilled, but, uh, but uh, I'm, just, I'm lacking in that area. 
I understand that, and I appreciate your honesty in this context because, you know, Matthew 5, it seems like he's spinning, uh, he's using extreme metaphor there. You know, I didn't come to uh, annihilate it or destroy it. I came to fulfill it. But he keeps talking. And he said, listen, you're going to be considered least in the kingdom uh, if you teach people to go against this law. If you continue reading, then he starts bringing up these teaching points about the law. You know, you've heard it said, like I stated a few minutes ago, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you something differently. And so he's teaching people something different than the Mosaic law. He's contesting the law there. And it's obvious that when he heals people on the Sabbath and tells them to get up and walk, he's actually challenging their Sabbath law uh, rules and regulations. And I think that Paul was quite clear in stating that Jesus came and abolished the law with its commandments and regulations. And so how can we really square these things up or reconcile them? Because if the writer of the book of Hebrews is right, if he did not follow after the order of Aaron, but he followed after the order of Melchizedek, a completely different kind of law would have had to follow. Let me make one other point that I want to ask you a question. Uh, Jesus stated that you could take the law and wrap it up in one simple term, and I'm paraphrasing. He simply said that you could say that the law is equivalent to love. Now, in your estimation, when you read the Old Covenant, after all those passages I went over with that dear evangelist slash pastor the other night, do you think that the Old Covenant is equivalent to love? Yeah, it sure doesn't seem like it. Um, no, not whenever you take all the ordinances uh, written. Um, I mean, you look at the Ten Commandments, and there's obviously some some good things there. Uh, you know, <laughs> obviously it's wrong to kill. Killing is not love. Um, uh, but even uh, whenever you look at the rest of it and uh, how they were instructed to take care of those who broke the law, there was a lot of killing involved. So I don't even see how the Ten Commandments and the rest of the, the so-called law was uh, even compatible. Um, I hope that answered it. Yeah. What I'd like to do, I'd like to bring another gentleman in. I want to bring in Enzo, and I want not just us to have a conversation with him, but I also want you to jump in. Would you mind doing that? Uh, definitely. That'd be great. Okay. We're so enjoying you tonight. And by the way, if you guys have any kind of questions, um, please text in to 850-572-7441. And we are getting a lot of compliments on everything that you're stating thus far. And we're so happy to have you here. In fact, I want to ask you uh, to be on our show Wednesday night to continue the Matthew 2546 uh, chat that we were having. Simply because sure. I have a, a man by the name of Rick Farewell. Uh, he's an excellent pastor. And I think that he's probably close to where you are, that is, in, in posturing Matthew 25, the context of it. And I think it's going to be an exciting evening, and so I want you to be there, and um, I want you to really punch hard and put your position forward, would you? That sounds great, okay. definitely. We really love having you on the show. Um, in fact, I'm just reading bragging point after bragging point after bragging point concerning Steve. We realize Thank that. You. We applaud Steve. Okay, let's bring on uh, Enzo. Yeah. How are you doing, sir? Uh, pretty good, yourself? Oh, uh, doing well. What do you think about the conversation so far? Um, it's very different from what I normally hear. I normally hear about um, the more literal interpretation of the Bible. Uh, even that being said, um, I find a lot of errors in uh, just the way of which things have been said. Uh, to the Bible, they're accurate. Uh, um, when, when I talk, I'm talking about the, uh, the copies and whatnot of uh, the final publication of the Bible and what was finally put into it, and uh, the thousands of copies it was copied off uh, uh, previously. 
Okay, uh, Let, let's go yeah. back into your history for a moment so people can get to know you. Uh, at one time, you were a Christian, correct? Ah, uh, yes. Okay, and you actually went to Bible college. I think it was uh, King's Christian College. Is that correct? It, it's not. It's not an actual uh, Bible college. It's a, a school, but okay. it's uh, it's called King's Christian College. Okay. So we're, we're different here. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want you to tell us about that transition from theism to agnosticism and from agnosticism into theism. You were sharing some of that with me, and I said, don't say it. Uh, I want it to be fresh on the show. Can you do that for me? I, I thought, you know, you're so kind, wonderful. Uh, you remind me a lot of uh, Greg Bray, except for a little bit younger. And you're a wonderful person. And so uh, just, Thanks. you know, give us a brief um, idea of what took place. Okay, well, um, this is about four years ago now, when I was in year eight or year nine, and uh, I was at my school, and it's a very Christian school, very fundamentalist uh, school, but they never talked about the bad side of the Bible, only uh, the good side, you know, praise Jesus, everything, and uh, I found that a few of my mates were uh, atheists. So I had a talk with them for uh, a long while, and uh, so I uh, set up an, uh, a time to meet up, and we went to the coffee shop and we had a long short, uh, short, uh, talk, and we were you know, checking out the chicks walking past and all that, and then we started to get into the actual topic. And uh, so I knew the only way to convince them or it'll shake them up a bit would be to uh you know look at what they had to say from their eyes uh if, if they brought any evidence you know when you talk about creationism or or anything else uh talked about in the bible as such uh i looked at the evidence through their eyes um and i i had a lot of questions myself so i couldn't really provide anything to rebut them so you know, we went home, went, on, went our separate ways, uh, at least for the day. And uh, I went on to all these uh, uh, Christian websites, creationist websites. I went back to the Bible. I uh, kept praying uh, full-heartedly. And uh, this continued back and forth for about a year and a half. And uh, I, I had more and more questions each time I would be talking to my mate. Uh, and less questions, uh, I mean, and less answers. And uh, the answers I gave were even not to my standards, not as sac satisfactory for when I, as a Christian, I'm providing him with answers. And even to me, myself, they weren't very satisfactory. I knew what he wanted, and I would expect the same. So, uh, and, and he delivered as well. So uh, I found that a bit nerve wracking, I guess you could say. And uh, yeah. So we continued that for a little while longer, and then I started having my doubts. And uh, then he uh, started giving me a few books by um, but, uh, Bart E. Herman, I think that's how he says his last name. And uh, I Googled, uh, uh, YouTubed him, I, uh, again, read a few of his books, and he hit the, hit the nail in the coffin of doubt, which was talking about the the New Testament in particular, which uh, so many parts of the New Testament are copied of other copies, not the original text. And uh, so I had more and more doubts into that. And uh, uh, when he started talking about the case against the resurrection, uh, that was more of the final blow for me. Uh, and the New Testament and being a Christian uh, and so I became more of an agnostic. Uh, and then from there, well, I was already an agnostic at the time, but that was, I was an agnostic for about a year, year and a half maybe. And uh, then eventually I became a, an atheist when I realized how you guys will disagree, pretty much all of you, that I uh, saw God to be an evil, twisted, sick character in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. 
Uh, and I still had a bit of problems with it in the New Testament, such as uh, love everyone unconditionally and all that stuff. It destroys the whole notion of love. And uh, yeah, so it, it, it took a long time. And uh, now, yeah, I'm all, yeah. when you're so. talking about some of these stories, are you talking about the Old Testament stories or the New Testament stories? Because I mean, I agree that there, there are some stories in the New Testament that are extremely maniacal. But are we talking about stories like we find in the Old Testament? Like, you know, when 42 children cursed, well, they didn't curse. They actually called Elisha Baldy and the prophet turned around and cursed them. And then God sent two she bears to maul the sweet little children to death. Is that the kind of stuff that you're talking about? Yeah, and pretty much everything, even in the New Testament. Uh, can you give us an example in the New Testament of what you're talking about? Uh, straight off the bat, the biggest one would be Jesus. Uh, and a bit of his preaching, which would be, uh, like I sort of said before, to love everyone. So love, love your wife. Love your best mate. Love the person down the street. Love um, the rapist. Uh, love the murderer. Uh, love the the juggo who is down the sh uh, a few blocks down the street, uh, selling drugs to kids and whatnot. Uh, or other adults destroying their brains, destroying their lives. Uh, love is something to be earned. That's what makes it special. Uh, so you, you hold people close to you, and you care for them. You actually love them. And then one of those people sticks out to you, uh, and you really have a thing for them. But it's you can't love everyone. You can have uh, sympathy for them, which is a, a, a natural thing for a fellow human. Uh, we're going into the neuroscience about that, which I can, but maybe another time. But of someone... Uh, there is, in a sense, it must be earned. Uh, you hold them close to you when you're talking about friends. Uh, again, uh, certain people stick out to you the most. But no, you, you can't. You can't. Uh, you can't love everyone as the same as you'd love your wife or your boyfriend or your husband, or even as your best mates to that extent. But have natural love for people, uh, sympathy for them when they're in pain. You feel sorry for them. You want to uh, help them. That all comes naturally. It's a natural thing. You know, Jesus stated something uh, for the sake of argument that he said the sick need a physician. And in the context, he wasn't talking about, uh, for instance, cancer alone or those kinds of things that we know about, uh, that is, concerning sickness. He was actually speaking about what people were calling sin. And mm. when we look at these passages in Greek carefully, we will find that Jesus was not advocating the theology of sin. In fact, he said people need a physician. In other words, he treated sin like a physician treats sickness. For instance, my father, he recently passed away. Uh, because he simply had cancer. And none of the physicians condemned him. They all, in fact, embraced him, accepted him unconditionally, and loved him. But they knew at the same time he had this problem inside of his body, and it was, it was just killing him, and it did. Mm. But they were able to help him, and they were so, so kind and it was it was wonderful to see that kind of unconditional love and acceptance. And I guess my question to you is, shouldn't we be almost like physicians to each other when we see other people having problems and doing wrong? Should we be filled full of condemnation and judgment? Or shouldn't we be like Jesus is suggesting, simply looking at other people and saying, well, they do have problems and it's obvious that they're doing wrong. But don't they need someone like a physician that can heal them? Uh, most people, pretty much all, 
when someone's in pain and in need, people will have empathy for them. They will feel uh, part of their pain in that sense. So, of course, they'll show uh, sort of like a love and compassion um, uh, towards the person. Uh, you know, uh, when I was a Christian, my dad, uh, sorry, my grandfather, I had ca uh, skin cancer. And uh, I was praying for him and all that. And you know, the nurses, they're, they're really kind, they're gentle, because that's what their job, in essence, demands. Um, so, and those people are emotionally attached as well. So, when he died in front of me, despite my efforts, um, you know, the, the ladies were there were, were crying as well for him. Uh, I was as too. Ev everyone is connected to each other emotionally. Uh, some people not so much, and that's due to the up upbringing or to, uh, we can say, brain damage to an extent. But everyone has a, a foundation of, uh, for you, it would be love. But however, it's more of a, a compassion, empathy kind of thing, where if I see someone on the street, a, a lady crying, and she tells me she's been raped, of course I'm going to... Uh, feel for her, I'm going to uh, try and help, I'm going to try to help her as best I can, no matter what. Uh, so everyone's so everyone's like that to an extent, as long as you're not a psychopath. Everyone's going to be like that. You, you can't really say it's Jesus, Jesus' teaching when it's natural for us. So I, I guess I, I'm simply going back to a fundamental question of what love is. Uh, let's say for the sake of argument that uh, there was no Jesus. And let's say for the sake of argument that we have these manuscripts and they simply tell us what love is. For instance, it says that love is kind. It says that love is also patient. Mm -hmm. And it states that love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. In fact, it says that love is faithful. Would you agree with any of those statements that the scripture says about love? Uh, most of them, yeah. But love itself, to the most simplest extent, uh, is chemicals in your brain when you actually talk about what love is. But the how you say love, yeah, I, I guess you can say that, yeah. Okay. I want to bring. Can I say something? Yeah, I want to bring Steve in, and I was going to uh, <laughs> bring you in, but I'm glad that you want to jump in. Go for it. Yeah, um, you know, whenever we look at everything that Jesus said to do, like in Matthew chapter five, uh, we'll again find a list of impossible things to do. We, uh, as humans, in the state that we're in, um, I have found to be, you know, incapable of loving, as the scripture describes, uh, forgiving instantly. Like I said earlier, if you hit me, uh, there's going to be at least a moment <laughs> where I hold it against you. Uh, and uh, so what I have uh, come, to, uh, come to the conclusion that Jesus wasn't always giving commands uh, for us to uh, necessarily be able to live up to or, or even judge ourselves and say, well, I'm not doing everything Jesus said you know, for me to do, but rather, you know, he showed us his nature. Um, you know, I understand uh, what Enzo's saying about not uh, being capable of loving the drug dealer down the street. Uh, does God love that drug dealer? I, you know, that's his child. It's a lot easier for him to do it. As humans, uh, it is not easy for us to love people that act uh, in such ways um, so I understand why, uh, you know, he would say that, you know, we shouldn't love that person because actually sometimes we feel guilty, uh, loving someone that's hurt someone else. I, I know that I've uh, had friends that have been victims of other people. And even though I was not the victim, I have held, uh, a, sometimes some pretty rough hate in my heart towards that individual that hurt my friend. You know, I did not feel that love towards that person. Uh, should I? Yeah, maybe I should. Uh, but I don't think that uh, that we are quite as capable. And, and that's why I say that 
whenever Jesus was giving these examples of things to do, he was uh, showing us what perfection looks like, what God looks like. And, and he was, we cover this in our book, uh, um, The Hour We Least Expected. Uh, we call it uh, requirements and disqualifications. Every time somebody thought uh, that they were uh, approaching uh, qualification uh, with God, he would always come in and say, but did you sell everything you had and give it to the poor? <laughs> or did you love everybody? Or, yeah, um, you're not supposed to uh, commit adultery, but if you even look at that woman the wrong way, you know, so every time uh, we thought that we approached uh, qualification on our own, you know, he seemed to disqualify us with something uh, that was, was hard, but at the same time revealed his nature. Uh, that's the way I see it. Um, I understand what the brother's saying about uh, uh, about that being extremely difficult to love everybody. Mm. Enzo, why don't you comment to yeah. that? Uh, you can uh, say, uh, Jesus, if uh, if the documents are even closely accurate, which I highly argue against. Uh, you can say that Jesus was a uh, sort of like the hippie of their day, where he's he's talking like back in those days they were they were very hate, uh, hateful towards each other for obvious reasons, uh, with religion backgrounds, just little tribes always having at each other, uh, and, and so you could say uh, say that or look Jesus as if he was more of the hippie of his day, where he. Um, he understood that peace was a good thing. And so he wanted everyone to treat everyone right and equally. He just hated the idea of fighting and whatnot. Uh, and, and that's that's uh, that's all I'd have to say on uh, you guys getting the morals from him. But some morals I, I wouldn't dare touch from him, like uh, uh, do unto others as you... Uh, done to yourself. Uh, you, you wouldn't want to say to masochists, you know, following that rule really, because you know they like injure themselves and they like pain. So, but 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 if is, like that let, let me interrupt you. Isn't that taking it a little bit too literal? Uh, what if Jesus was trying to nuance this in the context of someone who wasn't sick? Certainly, he wasn't speaking about someone who is ill in the mind doing to yourself as you would have them doing to you. You know, some people are extremely sick. And so when you analyze the text for what it says, is actually the author of this text actually suggesting, um, you know, some sadist somewhere to uh, do unto, you know, others as he would do unto uh, himself. Uh, I, I don't think that's even close to being remotely possible in the Greek text. What do you think? Uh, no, that's uh, of course the, uh, Jesus wouldn't be talking about them, or they probably didn't even have a real sort of uh, establishment as being a what we call a Damascus. But um, it, just that whole notion, uh, I, I wouldn't touch because uh, I, I would do it to others. But I mean, if you're looking at the extremes, you know, you wouldn't want them following. So if there was a a, a universal kind of law that everyone abided by, including say the masochists, well, then you've got a problem. Uh, so I, I wouldn't be abiding by that one at all, neither with uh, love everyone. Uh, but the Old, the Old Testament, uh, sorry, the New Testament, I don't have much of a problem with in much of its teachings, but uh, with Jesus, I've got a, a problem with that, uh, uh, this, uh, the crucifixion. So are, um, are are you stating that it's it's best not to love everyone? Is that is that correct? You've or, got as humans, as uh, animals, type of, we all have uh, what's called sympathy neurons uh, or mirror neurons, which uh, they don't in a sense they don't know the difference between themselves and others. So that's how we have sympathy, compassion. Uh, we feel guilt. Um, and all that is because they they see themselves as as others. So that's how we have a kind of emotion. Uh, and so everyone's got this sort of, I guess you could say, baseline of love. 
uh, again, apart from your, your ill-minded people to an extent, um, where if you uh, see, more, see someone who's uh, tripped, uh, stubbed the ankle, they're going to, if you're close near them, you're going to go to them and help them out or you're going to go, oh, gosh, I hope he's all right kind of thing. Um, and you see someone get shot, most people, depending on their fit levels, they would run to them and help the person out. Uh, everyone's got this sort of, I guess you can say, baseline of love. However, when you're talking about people special, like your best mates, just normal friends, uh, the, one, the one you love, that's reserved for a higher place. You, because those, those levels of baseline love uh, are picking out. And so, you know, you want well, to marry this person and relationship with them or with your mates, you, you have a strong bond with them. I don't have a strong bond with the, some, some uh, random down the street, but I've got a, a baseline love with I, I see them in pain or if, if they need money to get onto a bus, I would uh, help them out. Well, let me let me ask you something, Enzo. Um, do you think that love can actually change this world? For instance, if yeah, it would. It, it uh, love would change the world. Yes. Okay, but so we we wouldn't have you know shootings if people could love, uh, regardless if it came from Jesus, if it came from just our own you know cultural. Um, you know, memes. I mean, if we loved everyone, I doubt we would go around shooting or, or stealing or, you know, if we could love like that, I, I believe it would change, you know, the whole dynamic of this world. Uh, it, like I said, everyone's got this baseline of what you can say is love. I uh, see people running around, uh, shooting people, especially in the U.S., um, a lot of people with these uh, shootings uh, have mental disorders. Right. Um, the, the most recent one in that school, uh, that was very well known that he was uh, uh, ill-minded. And uh, the, the worst thing I saw on Facebook was all the people um, condemning this man for, for being an evil, sick bastard when when all the wars was an augmentation of his reality. It's not his fault, for example, for him. Uh, I brought up the argument so many times, which no one bothered to refute, which was if a soldier comes back uh, from war and he had a severe case of PTSD, uh, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, if he had a, such an augmented, uh, an extreme case of that, uh, and because it's the US, you know, you've got your guns at home, uh, if, if he comes back and, and so it's that extreme case where he now, his flashbacks now turn into reality. So he's there in the moment on that battlefield, but now it's changed to where he's in the US, he's on his home ground, he's safe. But he sees some people carrying something that looks like a gun. He sees them as a, an insurgent. Sure. Or he sees uh, little kids and he tries to hurry them along while he starts engaging people. You can't blame him for being evil, as some people do. It's his augmented reality, and to what he's doing is just, but it's not where he is. So, well, you, you, you know, there, there's a saying that a lot of people use, and it's, you know, hurt people hurt people. And I think we can apply that uh, in many cases when we see what you're talking about you know, the soldier that comes back with PTSD or someone that their, their brain is, you know, um, dysfunctional for a chemical imbalance or a neurological problem. Uh, I mean, we can get into so many different things, but, you know, you're talking about the baseline of love. And if we just had the basis of the, the smallest bit of love, toward everyone um i do believe and i think you do too that uh, many things can change in this world people that work with troubled teens they they have to love you know two and three hundred kids you know there has to be something in them that is called love to do this 
Oh, of course. They, 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 again, it goes back to their baseline that they see. They see these people in need, so they help them, so they start working with them. And the more they work with them, the, the stronger that connection is. Right. It, it, it's like I, I see someone down the street, uh, they need help, and people contact afterwards, and I keep helping that person through their struggles. Uh, say a, a lady, I was at the, uh, the bus station, right? And uh, this lady came up to me asking for $3 uh, so she could get on because her card ran out of credits. So I said, oh, yeah, sure. If I kept contact with her and I stayed talking to her and had a good conversation and maybe I asked why was she out of money for that sense and get into this whole thing and then I started to help her, um, you, you start to have more of a connection. You, that, that sympathy, that compassion for that person grows stronger. So for people working with uh, uh, troubled teens, it will get stronger. That's just how it works. Right. Um, I mean, but, but how come we can't branch out? I mean, aren't we intelligent enough to be able to, you know, spread ourselves across the board to humanity uh, itself and say, you know, I love my fellow human beings. I, uh, I can do that. I can sympathize with them. I can love them. I don't have to be in contact with them on a day-to-day -day basis, but I know that we're all going through the same struggles. And so, therefore, I can identify with them. I, I can see what you're getting at, but the, the reason why uh, uh, it's like a, a utopia where everyone loves each other so much, I, I don't think that will ever happen because you have people who are, in such a, a struggle in their life that the only alternative they have, so if they've got a, a lack of education, uh, they're in a, a bad part of town or they're in a country that's really bad uh, and they, they're, they're basically going off survival instinct uh, and because they have, they have no one around them, right. uh, be more independent, so they will steal, they will rob, they would do whatever, it's ne whatever is necessary for them to survive. Right. Uh, so in a sense, to some degree, morals just go straight out the door in order for them to survive. It, it's a, a very natural thing. Um, the re another reason for uh, a global thing won't happen is because uh, people have different differences in religion. Uh, a big, big issue is religion. Um, and it's going to take a lot of uh, collaborating with different religions. So, like the the Muslims and the Jews, just for example, illustration. They've been going at it for many, many years. No stop in sight. Um, so, you're going to have those problems. You're going to have uh, fighting over resources. Um, all these things can change that base, as in a sense, baseline of of love, it's going to change it so that's going to be now weaker because they're fighting for resources, they're fighting over who's got the correct religion and all that stuff. So it, it's it's very um, susceptible, it's very easy to mold in that sense because you've got all these different factors that can easily overrun that if it comes for survival or a better country or who's got the right religion. Right. I understand that. And I have two things. Um, one, that is one of the main um, goals, for lack of a better word, of the New Covenant group, which we are uh, definitely a part of, to bring people together, you know, atheists and agnostics, theists, people that couldn't care less, just human beings in general, bring us all together because we're all part of the human race and and if we can start with that we have that in common and you know we're tired of, and, and america is um the world's worst about us against them you know we've we've been there too long we've said you know it, it's us against islam it's us against whatever and so we want to put a stop to that. And in our lifetime, we may not see it, but that is something that we're definitely striving for to put us all on this equal, you know, playing field because we are. Um, um, I'm not sure how you guys feel about the war right now, but um, from my standpoint, uh, it's very beneficial, especially because you're about equal rights. 
uh, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with uh, Islam and how they treat their people. Uh, they're extremists, uh, a very small group. Right. However, they uh, hold reins over people, and it's uh, it's very demonstrated by the the term that we give them: terrorists. They use ter uh, terror to control their people. Uh, the, they're a minority, definitely. Sure. However, they're very powerful. Um, they, women can't get an education. People, uh, women that try will get shot, executed. Um, people who fight against them for their own freedom or sting, still being uh, Islamic, uh, they want a bit more of a freedom. Yet, just for that, they'll get shot or executed in some, some right. horrible manner. And that's just Troops not in the terrorist sect. That is yeah, in Islam across the board. And even in the United States, in a lot of our denominations and, and religions, you know, women are treated as second-class citizens, and we're totally against any organization or group that treats anyone as a second-class citizen. Mm. So, uh, yeah, and that's where you've got sort of terms with uh, atheists where we're the same. We want everyone to be treated equally, and sadly, religion, uh, most religions don't uh, agree to that term. So that's, that's right. Why we so that's it. That's right. Well, you we have that in common. Um, the New Covenant group and atheism, we want everyone should be treated equally. And and number two, Enzo, you it sounds like to me that you believe that Jesus is a true historical figure. Uh, not really, no. Okay, well, you, what, earlier you were saying, you know, Jesus taught this, Jesus taught that. I, I just made an assumption. Yeah, going, going off the Bible, I make those arguments. However, going back to the original manuscripts and whatnot, there's not enough there uh, at all to the, the earliest uh, document of Jesus. I didn't say Jesus, it was Christ. You, uh, I'm not exactly sure when the assertion of Jesus came into it, but it was much later on. Yeah. Uh, are, you, are you fluent in Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic? Uh, no, but I've read many, many uh, books on the very to uh, topic of, uh, uh, of Hebrew and uh, Greek on this topic uh, through Bart e. Herman, I think he's, I'd say his last name, uh, and he went to Bible Institutes, Media Bible Institute. He went to, uh, he's well, he's been doing this thing for 30 plus years and uh his story is a bit like mine, or mine's a bit like his. Uh, it's a very slow transition, and he actually looked at the uh, early documents. Uh, the earlier you, you go, there's more errors, contradictions uh, between the papers and whatnot as you go. Uh, so you, you can't, every, even the quotes of Jesus, apparently Jesus, can't be trusted in that sense. Uh, um, many, many famous little stories uh, in the New Testament I actually copied off another copy, and that if you go back to its earlier uh, earlier versions, that wasn't even in there. So uh, many things uh, can't be trusted in that sense of the Bible, of the New Testament, because they cop uh, copied off thousands of other copies, and the earlier you go, the more errors, contradictions, etc., there are between them. Uh, I, I would disagree with you as a linguist and a Bible translator completely. Because I admit that there are 400,000 textual variants, that is, when you deal with all of the manuscripts. But at the same time, I would argue that there isn't any ancient... Uh, the, the New Testament has more manuscripts that actually datify uh, sensibly so and reasonably so something that's actually genuine of the first century making than anything that we've ever had in the history of mankind. And so the, the further back we go, we have less inconsistency. When you go back into the Unshul manuscripts, I don't know if you're aware of the Unshuls at all, but when you investigate the Unshuls, we do not have the textual variants. Um, 
like we do in what we call the minuscule manuscripts, it would be spurious to make that argument. And when you look at higher and lower forms of textual criticism, you're going to find that the majority of the criticism is towards actually the minuscule manuscripts, which never came along for hundreds of years after the fact. And when you look at the uh, uncial manuscripts, which were actually, uh, that's how they were written in the first century. Even though we do not have an autographa, um, these these manuscripts are are dynamic. I mean, they have they have extreme consistency. Now we're not talking about consistency from just one person, but we're talking about people writing and people writing under the. Uh, and uh, let me back up for a moment. Do you know what an objod is? Uh, pardon, what's that? Do you know what an objod is? Since you've studied yeah. the text, I, I'm assuming that you know what an objod is. No. Okay. Nice, no. Okay. Let me let me familiarize you. An objod is actually a consonantal text. That's what the old covenant is. It's mm. a consonantal text. It doesn't have any vowels. It's also a nominal uh, structured language. And so you have various problems with it, and it's very ambiguous, and none of the Jews ever treated any of their writings as anything as an accuracy-based read. In other words, what you find in Protestantism and also in Catholicism is just bunches, uh, I should say, just lots and lots of metalanguage. That's all it is. Mm. But when it comes back to an objod, the writing system in particular of the Old Covenant, it's ambiguous. No one understands what it means. However, mm. when Jesus came, the interesting thing is those people called disciples could have kept the tradition, that is, of writing in an objod that is, using the consonantal text, and it could have remained extremely ambiguous, but they didn't. They chose to translate the words of Christ. The words of Christ were in Aramaic, and they translated these words into Greek, taking the chance by putting together something in an accuracy model language. Now, that says a lot. Number two... Mm -hmm. We're talking about not just one or two manuscripts. We're, we're talking about thousands upon thousands of manuscripts. Now, I'm quite certain that you've studied Aristotle. But when mm -hmm. you look at the uh, manuscripts concerning Aristotle and the rest of the ancients, uh, it fails in comparison to what you find with the New Testament manuscripts. And so those people who take a lot of shots at the manuscript evidence that we have, they don't know what they're talking about because you have manuscript evidence that's awesome. Now, I don't agree with church theology. I'm against church. I don't agree with the renderings that we have in our English text. I don't agree with any of it. But as a linguist, I can say with certainty that there are some values within these manuscripts that are so incredible that they can't even be replicated. If you had 10,000 computers, you could not replicate what they did back in the first century with these kind of manuscripts. And we have people today who have been involved in reconstruction models of these things. And now we're within 10 to 15 years close to, um, that is, the original text of, that is, the original writings of these individuals and we can do this through linguistic science and in all other kinds of sciences and so i i don't think the the books that you're reading are adequate uh that is for the argument concerning the text i find that to be extremely failed what, what are your well, ideas would, uh after further discussion with this i would uh get what you're talking about and I'll uh, send an email to him and see, what, see if he's actually well versed uh, of what the things you've been mentioned. Uh, and if he comes back with a negative in a sense, then I'll take your word for it. Yeah, I, I would, I would love to have that person on my show uh, 
Because let me tell you something. I make a lot of critical remarks concerning the New Testament and the Old Testament. I'm honest with what it is and what it isn't. But no one can legitimately say that everything with these manuscripts is completely spurious. There's one thing that we have certain. 2,000 years ago, there was a huge paradigm shift. And there was never anyone who ever suggested that love never kept a record of wrongs. That's something that's just unusual. That's just out of the blue. Now, whether you want to believe in Jesus, and I'm not trying to convert you. I'm simply trying to say, let's look at some evidence. We have a text that says love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. How meaningful is that? And before that period in time, when you look at all the manuscript evidence, you're looking at all kinds of people who lived according to killing spree theology. We're talking about the pagans and the way that they lived, all kinds of people that, that comes, stayed in that context. From, even if it comes from uh, God himself? I, 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 did, back, I, I failed to get your point. I, I could not hear you. Could you oh, repeat sorry. that? I, even if it comes from God? Are you talking about the text, the words, the the no, right? The, the, um, I'm talking about the Old Testament here now. I, I don't think, uh, and I, I, I don't mind stating this, I don't think that any of the Old Testament came from God, no. Okay, so if none of it comes from, if you think that, so you, so you think the Old Testament is completely unreliable, it's, it's a load of... I, I didn't say that it was unreliable. I, I just simply stated that I don't think that it came directly from God. I think it's simply what man perceived God to mean or say. We all have perceptions. In other words, so, science itself is built upon assumption. No one can claim that science is exact and absolute. Everything that we argue is based upon assumption. You have uh, one no, model no. after another model of assumption. And these people back in the ancient world, they were dealing with their assumptions. Now, now it's true that every year, every decade, every century, we start rethinking things. They thought, wow, when they had a hurricane, that was the judgment of God. But as time went on and as people were evolving, they started learning a handful of things. And so they started readjusting their ideas and their perceptions. And so I can accurately uh, say that these writings of the Old Testament are simply what man said, God said, not what God actually said. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, of course. Um, so, as a linguist, you would uh, uh, agree that how the Ten, um, Ten Commandments came about. Uh, you, you guys were talking about that earlier. Uh, you would agree that uh, when you're reading about how Moses got his Ten Commandments, that it's talking about a volcano, a, uh, a volcano going off. I don't think it's possible to even render that text. It's an object. Now, everything that we have concerning the Ten Commandments. First of all, when he was coming down off of the mountain, he did not give the Ten Commandments, quote-unquote, according to oral tradition to the people. Those were broken. And so he did not give it at that particular time. It was later in history where God supposedly, and this is all according to oral tradition. This is not hmm. according to the text because no one can tell what any of those ancient authors actually were writing. Dr. Foer mm. actually makes the statement. He said that these things were treated as a creative process. They were treated like abstract art, and the Jews have always utilized their texts like abstract art. It's like going to an art show, and everybody says, oh, to me it means this, to another one it means something different. And so mm. it was all about perception, and they did this to keep liability issues down. And that's why the Jews normally laugh at the Christians, because the Christians have... Uh, this idea that the Old Testament is to be taken literal and, and it's to be taken only one way. And the mm. Jews keep evolving and they keep moving forward in a sense. And so maybe that can make some sense. And I'm certainly not trying to convert you. I'm just trying to stimulate a little bit of intellectual and spiritual and scriptural honesty. I want to go to Steve mm. for a moment. I've really enjoyed you uh, tonight. And I want you to come back here in a few minutes and state some some more things, but uh, Steve, I want you to jump into the conversation. What do you have to add? 
Oh, we talked about a lot there. <laughs> I, I would like to, to back up uh, to where we were talking about um, the, uh, the shootings and things, uh, because I get a lot of people that say things like, uh, well, now, if we, you know, if we all come to the conclusion that everyone goes to heaven no matter what and that everybody's forgiven, uh, I can't tell you how many people have actually said, well, oh, well, then that means I can go out and kill and rape and steal and, and uh, no, you know, I can't even believe that they would get such a thing like that. And I can't believe that, that people would think that uh, teaching love and acceptance would actually cause anyone uh, to behave in such a manner. Uh, mm -hmm. What I've, uh, you know, uh, witnessed with, you know, just looking at the world is that, you know, it's those that uh, feel rejection um, that uh, are more likely to turn into such monsters, you know, <coughs> that, uh, that kill and, and hurt other people. Uh, anyone that has, uh, has had love and reject or love and acceptance uh, lavished on them is, you know, I'm not going to say incapable of doing evil things, but uh, would be far less likely to do so. Um, I think that love and acceptance, and again back here in Matthew chapter 5, even though earlier I said we are incapable of living it out to the perfection that uh, I believe Jesus is, is trying to show us here, uh, still that is our model. That is, if, if we can do that, he says in the last verse there, that we would be perfect like God. And if we can do that love and accept everyone, then uh, I think the world would be a much better place. Here's a viewer comment. This person says, wow, the comment that Steve made about falling or failing, excuse me. Let me reread this. Wow, the comment that Steve made about failing to love the drug dealer, failing to love those who have hurt people, was powerfully honest. It was a risky comment and the kind of language that makes us all look at ourselves honestly. There's also one in there that says... Um, Great point, uh, Ozzy, I believe. <laughs> yes, Ozzy. Right? Isn't uh, that right, yeah, Enzo? That, uh, you don't say yeah, Aussie. Aussie, you say Ozzy. Ozzy, yeah. That's right. <laughs> well, you know, Aussie. no, it's not. No, we have people not. in the studio crying, out, it's Aussie, it's Aussie. They're just, they're just uncultured. I, I want Enzo right here, right now to correct this. It's not Aussie, it's Aussie. Aussie. Yeah. That's right. Aussie. Exactly right. You, you know, I, I was going to say, um, according, uh, well, per Steve's comment, people will say, well, you know, if, if you don't believe there's a hell, then you have this license to go out and do what you want because there aren't any repercussions. Well, I found in my own life when I came to the c conclusion and the absolute you know, knowledge that there is not a hell that people will go to, you know, I'm a better person, to be honest with you. I, I, I haven't, you know, I don't have any reason whatsoever because I, I have learned more about the love of God. And when I understand how much he loves me that much more, when you know somebody loves you like that, you want to do more to please them. So that's just a false, um, that's a myth to say that because there isn't a hell, you'll go out and do worse. That, that's not true in my experience, I'll say. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I find yeah. it the same thing. Go uh, ahead. I, um, I find it the same thing. Like, uh, it's not as uh, popular down under, but um, uh, as America, where if you say you're an atheist, you know, you're ridiculed in a sense. Uh, especially in the Bible, but of the U.S. But um, uh, I, I've come across a few instances, instances where they think that you're immoral because you don't uh, believe in a higher being and whatnot, and and it does get you. But sure, and you laugh at them and and whatnot, and have a have a bit of a uh, a joke with them. I agree. Uh, and if and if they're serious, you know, it's a bit more more serious. Uh, I was reading a um. An article uh, that in Arizona that um, they're trying to pass a bill that uh, says that atheists aren't allowed to uh, graduate high school, and uh, I, I reposted on my Facebook, and that got me quite quite pissed uh, for the obvious reasons. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, and it's uh, it's not a, a thing for, for to laugh to laugh off because um, uh, it's a very serious issue. Saying that atheists, because they don't believe in God, the Almighty God, as they put it, uh, is is a real issue. Uh, and uh, it's yeah, it's very putting off in a sense. Sure, um, I to agree. To people, to people in the U.S. who are atheists. Uh, who are in the closet, especially in the quote-unquote Bible Belt of uh, the U.S. Uh, it's very um, uh, wrong of Christians to do such uh, in those areas. I agree. Um, I agree. Absolutely. I agree. Absolutely. I'd like to say something. I, I agree Go with for that it. also. I actually have two very close friends uh, that are atheists. Um, uh, one that uh, I, I eat with almost every single week, and uh, we're really good friends. The other one I talk to on Facebook all the time. We've had lunch a few times, and, and I have to say that I have not found uh, any um, less uh, moral values uh, in mm. their lives than I you know have in my own. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, back to what Rhonda was saying, as uh, coming to the conclusion that everyone uh, is forgiven uh, by God has made me a better person, has probably brought my morals up to the level that theirs <laughs> were already at. So, uh, so yeah, I agree that I think that my own capacity to love has increased uh, whenever I stop believing in hell and, sure. and realize that God loves everybody yeah. and Absolutely. made it easier for me. That's good. I, I want to ask both of you guys uh, the same question. And here it is. It, it appears, and I may be wrong, it appears that atheists are more willing to be intellectually honest than theists. Why is that? Mm. Uh, I would say well, fear. Yeah, they, fear on the side of the theist. Okay, go ahead, Anzo, and, and you, you answer that first. Why is that? Um... Yeah, uh, I was watching a, a video on YouTube that pointed this out a, a few days ago. Uh, I think it was from the Thinking Atheist um, that someone was uh, watching uh, watching videos from either Christians or or atheists, and they read they got bored of that, so they went down to the comments. And so instead of uh, doing what this bloke usually does and uh, Comments and tries to refute the the uh, Christians or anything. He he sends them personal messages on YouTube. So he asks them. I, I forgot exactly what he asks, but he says something along the lines of, uh, "Would you become an atheist? What what would make you an atheist? Uh, and could you become an atheist?" Uh, and to sum it up, pretty much all the people he contacted uh, that. Eighty something percent, I think it was, said no, they wouldn't deconvert, even if all the evidence pointed against their literal interpretation. If you were to shake them up in their faith quite a bit, they still wouldn't, out of just because of that. And uh, and he did the same thing to all the atheists, and they all said, if you were to prove God, if you were to prove Jesus, uh, did what he did, if you were to show me. Uh, there's an apparent demon inside of me, if you take it that literal, or um, if you show me uh, angels and all that kind of stuff, and you're really to uh, prove it to me, then I would become, a, I would believe. I wouldn't necessarily become a Christian, but I'd believe uh, and, and in that sense. And I probably would because you guys don't think um, anyone goes to hell. So for that, they'd probably, you know, God, God, I, I probably would if there was no hell. Um, because personally, I can't be in, in heaven if someone's if people are burning and and rotting in hell in that sense. Exactly. Um, I yeah, do that. I, I respect that. Right. That's wow. Sure. I mean, we need to applaud you right now because who can be happy in heaven while they have loved ones and even any human being burning mm. and being tortured in hell? And I think that uh, Steve would applaud that too. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, you, you know, um, Enzo and Steve, and I say this a lot um, when I'm speaking, but if if we really, really believed in hell, even far back 20 years ago, if, if I really, really did, 
in my core believe there was a, a literal burning hell that people were in, there's no way in this world that I could go to sleep at night and, and be comfortable and lay down and, and just sleep with like nothing's wrong. So I, I just, I really don't believe people really, when they get down to it, really believe in a literal hell or how in the world could you go to sleep at night? How could you be at peace? How could you, you know, enjoy yourself? You, you just couldn't. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, and I have to say that I did spend many, many nights. Uh, I've made a few videos uh, that talked about this, you know, where I laid in bed thinking about my friend or my family member that, you know, it had either passed away or, you know, I was constantly worried about somebody, you know, going to hell. And, and so now, you know, now that I step back and, and look at others around me, uh, even, even pastors um, that uh, do sleep so comfortably at night, I can't help but, but think, uh, right. you know, that we, we would have to be so selfish, you sure. know, to, to be able to enjoy our life knowing that anybody's going to go to hell. You know, and, and what does that say about uh, God's uh, ability to have mercy? You know, you take the the most you know evil man in the world. You know, if Osama was still around, you know, would I be able to to take a torch to him? Uh, I don't think I could do it. You know, and even if even if he had just committed his crime and killed my family, you know, could I could I torture him? You know, maybe for a second, but it wouldn't take long until <laughs> I said, "Oh my gosh, you know, I, I have to stop. This is this is horrible. This is bad." Sure. But then yet we we turn right around and say that our loving God, you know, tortures people uh, not for a minute, but for all of eternity. And it just there's no way it can be true. No way. Right. Right. Now, you 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 made a comment, and I might have misunderstood it. Uh, and I was asking the question, why are, and I'm talking about seemingly, it seems like atheists are so, so much better at intellectual honesty. And I asked that question, and, and you, I think, Steve, you said that it was because theists are afraid. Is that correct? Yeah, and I just have to, you know, I've never put myself in the seat of an atheist, so I don't know... Um, you know, I can just say that back whenever I did my own uh, study, uh, and you'll hear train passing by now, I can hear it coming. <laughs> back when I did my, uh, my own study, uh, I found several verses that were, were telling me Jesus saved everybody and everybody's going to heaven. But man, there was so much in me that wanted to, to reject that and not be... Uh, intellectually honest you know because of the fear uh, I man I can't uphold this new doctrine I've just heard you know I, I'm trying to prove it wrong you know the fear that was inside of me wanted to shut that off matter of fact that's what happened the very first night I started to see things in the Bible that I'd never seen before I got upset and, and put the book down hard and said no not tonight I'll, I'll pick it up tomorrow <laughs> something's wrong here you know I'm not finding the the things that I thought I would find uh, this isn't the same Bible I've read every day of my life. Um, and so out of fear, I stopped and I waited till the next night and, and proceeded again. And it, it was a very fearful thing uh, for me because, you know, what happens if I'm wrong? What happens if I, you know, come to this conclusion that Kim had come to? And what if I'm wrong? I mean, if hell's real, then, yeah, it's a, something that should be feared. Um, I, as Rhonda said, I don't think that uh, any normal person could live knowing for sure that hell is real and not uh, be absolutely terrified, you know, not just for yourself, but for, you know, your friends, your family, anybody. So, it sounds like what you're saying is in historical Christianity, um, they almost condition you to be insane because, you know, you, you can't handle change. You can't handle evidence. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, that's the thing that I really love about atheists, and I don't try to convert atheists at all. I love them. Greg Bray, he's one of our hosts here uh, at the New Covenant Group, and I, I don't, I mean, you can't find a more honest person, um, loving person. He is awesome. And, you know, sometimes we just start crying when we're watching his show because he's just so tender and so good. 
and so willing just to say, well, let's just look at the evidence. And um, he just has such a wonderful heart. And, and I'm hoping that our conversations with theists and atheists can become reasonable to where we can learn how to accept each other unconditionally maybe love each other unconditionally and tr yeah, quit uh, trying to push our agenda? Would that make sense? Yeah, for uh, atheists uh, like me, um, we don't try and get people to become atheists. We, uh, For the more literal interpretation of the Bible, we've got problems with that because the ripple effects uh, that has in, so uh, in society with you know homosexuals and, uh, and race and all, all that, uh, it's got more of a, a political uh, standpoint, whereas you're, you guys have a very uh, more modest, more liberal, in a sense, kind of, uh, kind of interpretation. Okay, well, let me ask you this. When you say you guys, be specific, are you talking about Christians? Well, uh, you, oh, I mean, uh, the new... Covenant your, group? Uh, your new covenant okay. church, I think it's called, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, I, we are not a church. I, I, you know, I was going to say, <laughs> please don't. I was going to say, don't <laughs> no. lump us in the whole category of of other Christians, <laughs> because <laughs> just like you know, we shouldn't label all atheists the same. You know, all Christians aren't the same, and we're mm. we're certainly not. You know, and and we are we are different, and and not so different that no one's like us, because Enzo. You know, I don't know if this is good news to you or, or, you know, you're ambivalent about it, but there is this, you know, surge of, of people coming to their senses and saying, you know, let's listen to everybody. The atheists need a voice. They have some good things to bring to the table of they discussion. Do. Yes. And, you know, theists, you should listen to them. We have good things, you know, to bring to the table of discussion. And so we don't need to disenfranchise any group we need to all you know give each other ear and mm. you know so I, you know as, as a young man um you know especially as a young person you would be more to me apt to listen to more people and not paint everybody with the same broad brush does that make mm. sense yeah definitely yeah uh yeah, thanks for that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, so so what are you guys again like? What's your the new covenant group? What's the ending to it? Group, okay. Yeah, yeah. group. <laughs> we're not a gang; uh, we're a club. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're simply a group of people. We put it together years ago simply to say it's not reasonable to exclude anyone. It's better to have people coming together, looking at the same evidence, and trying to figure things out. Um, it's not like the atheists have evidence, a different kind of evidence, and the theists have a different kind of evidence. We have all the same evidence. Let's look at it, and let's wrestle with it together. And I don't think that we should be afraid of wrestling with evidence together and we shouldn't be afraid of saying that everything isn't always objectively so in other words we have subjective experiences all the time my love with my wife i can't say that scientifically someone could prove the depth of my love for my wife but my subjective experience is what it is and it's more meaningful than anything in science to me. Mm. Uh, when you were talking about um, evidence between, in a sense, uh, theism and atheism, what, what would you consider evidence for atheism? I don't... Oh, well, I, I, I think that the, the atheist, and, and please understand, I think that most atheists are into science. Not all, but most. And I think they want to look at, you know, let's talk about creation. Is Genesis 1 actually accurate? And I think most people are laughing at Genesis 1, etc. Simply because uh, when you start looking at what we know today, that is in science, we know that, number one, evolution is true. Um, we don't have a perfect model 
of evolution, but we have a more workable model that makes sense to most people. Uh, that is in the context of science. And mm. so when you compare apples to apples, that is the church's rendition of Genesis, um, mm. that is the Catholic model and the Protestant model, it really doesn't become sensible. And this mm. is why I've taught for years when I deal with like Genesis 1. It's actually not called Genesis. The Jews call it uh, Bereshith. And they say, Bereshith bara Elohim et Shemaim veheharetz. And they do not take it in a literal sense at all. And in fact, mm. the term Bereshith actually means at first. It doesn't mean in the beginning at all. It's simply a way of stating something. And chapter mm. 1, verse 1 is not talking about the beginning of the heavens and the earth in a literal sense at all. It's actually talking about the premise of or the preface of the modeling of a covenant. And so most people are not linguists, but unfortunately mm. the church wasn't worried about selling a product that was completely genuine. So they put satyrs in the Bible, they put mm. hell in the Bible, and they want to scare the hell out of everyone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for me as an atheist and a evolutionist and whatnot, yeah, I, I do... So I guess you can say I sort of laugh at the people who take Genesis literally and uh, and other parts of the Bible uh, that are of that extreme, you know, like uh, God stopping the, the earth to keep a battle going. Uh, just a simple apply, application of physics. Um, uh, th th uh, things on earth wouldn't be so pretty uh, if God uh, stopped the earth rotation, you know, you got the flood and all that stuff. So... Yeah, uh, I um I make comments about that. I don't put them down. I don't think many people do, but there are some atheists that do, understandably, because to us, it's it's like a uh, a child's story of, of those things, not the whole Bible, but those things. It's like a a fairy tale in that sense. You know? Well, it but, is. Yeah, the yeah, the story of Noah and the Ark was actually borrowed uh, from some Ugaritic, uh, uh manuscripts, and the Jews actually plagiarized that story. Mm. And so please see. understand that, technically speaking, uh, much of what you see in the Old Testament was plagiarized, stolen oh. from other people. But back in oh, those I, days, I, they, they really didn't have a lot of ethics. They would sell their wives... Uh, buy their wives and 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 have slavery and go on killing sprees for Jesus. It, it was it, it was quite maniacal. Yes, I agree with you. I, I, I would maybe take. I, I would make the claim just above that and say that mo most of the Bible, including uh, the stories of the resurrection and all that, I, I would say that those were plagiarized uh, as well from our other other religions predating, you know, Jesus uh, in that sense, and mm. also uh, going off, um, oh, let's forget the name. Um, I, I would completely disagree with you, and here's why. I'm a linguist. I deal with manuscript evidence, and every atheist document to date that has suggested that we have various stories that are identical to the life of Christ and how he was born and went through 33 and a half years of his life, was actually crucified and all of that, those are built upon very spurious models of synthetic translation theories. And as a linguist and a translator, I would say that atheists are being very disingenuous in that. They are not being linguistically sound at all. They're using direct models trying to compare something that doesn't make sense to other things. And I think it's the most pitiful part of atheism because they are not practicing intellectual honesty, nor are they translating in an efficient way. And so please understand, if we're going to look at science, let's not exclude linguistic science. This is what I'm trying to encourage lots of atheists to do. Look at the documents. Look at the documents. Mm. And I think we well, will see something quite different. And, and this spin, and I see it all the time, but it's, it's just BS, and that's all it is. Mm. Uh, most, most people in the general public aren't linguistic like you. Uh, so if we're if we're told something, we'll do checks 
tactics on it to make sure that, that we're not making ourselves look stupid. But again, we're not that, uh, we don't have the sources or we're not training that in that area to actually check and actually compare. We can go to websites that do that for us, uh, but we can't, you know, be 100% accurate on those like, like you can because like you know your, that, that area better than most of us. Yeah, that's a fantastic so you, see, point, Enzo. Mm. You know, for instance, so, uh, if I were having a debate with Richard Dawkins, I would speak to him in Hebrew and Greek and teach the audience, number one, that Richard Dawkins is practicing outside of his discipline. Why would any atheist want to practice outside of his discipline? If you're going to be a good atheist, that is, in arguing that the Bible is completely wrong, the manuscripts, you should be able to at least be literate in the languages. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah, Yes, but when with Richard Dawkins, he tackles the fundamentals, the, the fundamentalists of. But of but the, that's of like the playing a shell so are game, the isn't it? A ABCs. Yeah, I mean that's playing a shit shell game. That's kind of like saying I'm going to uh, I'm going to say that I'm an atheist and I'm going to attack translations, but I'm not going to deal with a legitimate uh, text. And all linguists, all linguists will say mm. that all of the English translations are failed metalanguage. They have been mm. so tampered with. We're talking about the translations as opposed to the manuscripts. The manuscripts are much, much cleaner, and we do know not all about them, but we know enough now to legitimately say we have valid arguments. And so the question would be, why are not atheists capable of going back and looking at these things? And I find most atheists simply saying, I want to ignore it, and there's no use in looking back at history and having an accurate or even a meaningful understanding of, of what is in times past. But I think that linguistic science is good. We can learn from our past. We can learn from our past things like this. People who went, went on killing sprees, like when the first king of Israel was told by the prophet Samuel, go kill all these Amalekites, the men, the women, the children, and the infants. We can learn from that. We can say, mm. you know, that's sick. That's crazy. That's insane. Mm. And we can move on. And so I'm, I'm simply saying that isn't it better to be honest about these manuscripts and what they say? than it is to be a disingenuous. Because one of the things that really uh, gets me is um, atheists know more about the English Bible than most theists. Mm. But very few atheists know anything about Koine Greek, Attic Greek, First and Second Temple Hebrew, and the Aramaic. Mm. And they certainly are not yeah. good in linguistics. And, and so I'm, I'm really... I'm really, I, I don't understand why, how, how can you put can together a valid premise and have a valid conclusion? If you can't put together a valid premise, how can you make a conclusion that's valid? Go for it, Steve. Yeah, I, I uh, don't blame um, atheists for uh, the attack on um, the Bible, just simply for this fact. For you know, several hundred or thousand years, we've had uh, this group of Christians teaching that their way is the way, and mm. and then we have the group of atheists that say oh, that can't possibly be true. I have to commend the atheists for at least standing up and saying, "Wait a second, yeah. there's no way yeah, that God created the hell and this and that." You know, so meeting that doctrine head on i think is uh is probably a really good thing and they probably just haven't taken that next step because i mean when the most uh widely accepted christian argument is that god uh created a hell and 99 percent of the world's population is going to go there well then why would they even you know begin to listen to uh to us you know <laughs> we're trying to say wait a second that's not the whole story. I've actually had many atheists argue with me and tell me that I didn't know what I was talking about because the Bible does say there's a hell. You know, I'm, I go back to them and try to say, wait a second, no, it doesn't. It doesn't say that at all. And, and then they go on to quote scripture at me, <laughs> you know, and, I, and, uh, and so I completely understand where they're coming from. You know, they've been fighting that uh, argument for so long that they don't want to go any further. You know, they see that as mainstream Christianity, mainstream argument 
you know, for the Bible, and they reject it. And uh, and so well, for that, I, I understand why they're not willing to go to the next step. Right. I, they would. I, I believe that um, the weakest link in the uh, atheistic argument or is their uh, lack of linguistic expertise. Um, their strongest strength, I believe, is the ability to come and, and tell theists, hey, look at your God, especially the God of the Old Testament. Look how, you know, uh, crazy he is and schizophrenic. And, and they've yeah. really brought that to the table and, and made Christians have to stand up and, and take notice. And so exactly. I, um, let me read a comment. Um, Herbie Del Toro says, Enzo is one impressive Aussie. Aussie. Oi, oi, oi. Yeah. And Herbie also <laughs> makes another statement. Uh, let's see. Traditional theist. I have contact with do not like it when I say atheists have their good points. I think I read that right. Yeah, what basically Herbie's saying that his uh, theist friends sort of get uh, a little hot under the collar whenever he says, that's a good point, atheist. Now, Herbie also stated linguistic science is what caused my paradigm shift and view of the Bible. He said, thanks to Doc. Well, thank you, Herbie. Thank you. I tell you what, you know, one of the things that I'm really impressed about both of you guys both of you guys left that traditional concept of church. You guys both left that fundamental, you know, that fundamentalist type uh, movement and started thinking. And we are so proud of both of you guys. Both of you guys have added a lot to the conversation tonight. And um, what I'd like for you to do, we just have a couple of minutes left. I, I want you to make your most meaningful argument right now. And uh, Enzo, if you would take and do that first, I would appreciate it. Um, cool. It's a bit hard with uh, this new interpretation of the uh, of people who, who take this interpretation of the Bible. But... Um, if there are any atheists uh, listening or who will watch this in the future, um, uh, I'm glad that you've stepped out or if you've admitted that you're an atheist um, or, or if you're in the closet, um, depending on your situation, uh, take note of how people will react to being an atheist, especially in the uh, US uh, and the southern parts. Um, just, uh, again, I find this is for another time, but I find there's no reason to, uh, believe in a God at all. I find many in life to be, um, to be short, uh, this is the only life you got. And, uh, if there's a heaven that goes for eternity, or if you take hell, uh, I've read in the now it goes for infinity, it goes forever. Sure, the first hundred years, thousand years, a million years might be possible, but going for eternity, that really does your head in. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to live, uh, in a sense, live that long as well. Uh, and how, how I um, came to terms with uh, hell and uh, heaven is that, well, you can't burn because no atoms, so how can you burn? Uh, and if there's the heaven, um, how can you feel any bliss without your mind? So if I die, just let me rest and die. That's it. We do appreciate your comments. You have been so incredibly nice, kind, honest. And I want you to come back, would you? Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I want you to get your uh, friends, both atheists and theists, uh, to also come because what we're trying to do here, we're trying to gather people together and have a wonderful conversation. And we have so enjoyed having you tonight. Uh, Steve, Thank you. um, you're going to be on Wednesday night also with Rick. Uh, farewell. He's, he's, he's an excellent pastor. Um, and he's the kind of guy that really likes to get into the Greek and the Hebrew and all of that. And 
he was talking with me in a very powerful and meaningful way concerning uh, Matthew 24, uh, 25, 46, excuse me. And so Wednesday night, we're going to give uh, both of you guys a chance just to go after it. And so I want you to give uh, the last meaningful uh, point uh, from your position tonight, would you? Uh, sure. <clears throat> you know, and I'd like to talk about, you know, whether or not uh, the Bible is true. I, I said in our book, um, I believe it was in the first chapter of the hour we least expected that, uh, you know, it, I don't feel that it's my place or nor am I trying to prove that the Bible is uh, a real book, you know, or you know, obviously it's a real book. If it's a true story or, you know, uh, obviously you have some very good points, you know, to back that up that, uh, that it is genuine. Uh, but regardless of whether it's genuine or not, it has a message, you know, written inside of it, uh, contained in it. It's a, and that message is a mystery, and mysteries take uh, time to solve. So, uh, <clears throat> so what my goal is, what the hour least expected is to is to try to give you know my theory as to what that uh, that message is. You know, whether it's genuine or not um, in its stories. Uh, I believe the message is that God uh, loves us and forgives us uh, unconditionally and accepts us all unconditionally. And so therefore, I come away from the Bible saying we should love and accept uh, and forgive everyone unconditionally as much as, as that is possible. And, you know, with that message, I just don't think that, uh, that we can go wrong. Um, I don't think that... Uh, you know, God would be upset with us for saying uh, that there is no hell <laughs> because, you know, whenever we say that God loves and accepts everybody, you know, sometimes it comes across as, you know, we're giving God too much credit, you know, and I just don't think uh, that that would upset God uh, if he does exist. <laughs> right. Well, um, will you tell everybody how to get your book? Uh, yeah, you can actually uh, get more information at uh, thehourweleastexpected.com. There's actually a 21-page excerpt uh, from uh, Chapter 2, which is my favorite chapter of our book. Um, so we, we gave you one of our best points right off the bat there. Um, if you uh, read that and you like it and you want to hear more, uh, read the rest of it. Uh, you can go to Amazon.com and search the title, uh, or there's actually a link from our website uh, you're also free to uh, to uh, friend me on Facebook. I talk about this uh, stuff as much as possible, and I'm always posting links to the uh, Amazon account where you can buy the book. It sounds great. This has been a wonderful night. We've had two people, a theist and an atheist, and they want to be honest, and they have been, and they have something to say. I really enjoyed Refreshing. Uh, Enzo. Yeah, he sure. was awesome and you know he's a young man he's got a long way to go and uh, his heart is headed in the right direction his mind is headed in the right direction and I applaud him I mean I thought he was wonderful and also Steve he did a wonderful job tonight and it's going to take conversations like these uh, to continue to move forward that is uh, that is to move mankind forward. And so we'd like to thank you for being here at the New Covenant Group. Uh, we are not religious. Uh, we are not a church. We are simply a group of people who come together, atheists and theists alike. We want to be intellectually honest. Uh, we are not claiming that we're totally intellectually honest. Uh, I'm sure we have many problems, but we're trying to learn, and we're trying to learn from various people. And so our goal is to be intellectually honest. Our goal is to be spiritually honest, whatever that means, and scripturally honest. Now, if all of the scripture is uh, just folklore, uh, we will admit to it. But we need to at least examine whatever evidence that we do have. And so I'm going to say we would like to have a lot of people back at the place. Absolutely. That would be wonderful. And you are gorgeous. You are my wow. man. Well, thank you. Love you, honey. Love you, too. You guys have a good evening and good night. All right. Thank you. Enjoy. Good night. See you. Good night, guys. Cheers. Good night. Are the guys still on there?